Welcome to the Grace and Grit Podcast, made for women who want their healthiest years to be ahead of them, not behind them. Join your host, Courtney Townley, right now as she breaks down the fairy tale health story you have been chasing all of your life into sensible action steps and lasting change. Welcome to the Grace and Grit Podcast. This is your host, Courtney Townley. As always, thank you a million times over for taking time out of your schedule to be here with me. I massively appreciate it, and I hope you get a lot out of today's episode. Now, I want to start today by reading, uh, this is an email that I got from Seth Godin a while back, and I kind of kept it in my files because I think it's such a powerful reminder. For, for those of you who don't know who Seth Godin is, he, he largely, he writes a lot of books, um, and he does a lot of work to help business owners uh, put their work out into the world. I consider him a mentor. I've never met the guy, but holy cow, has he influenced my life as a business owner and really just as a human being. I feel like what he talks about is is so applicable across the human experience. It's not just applicable to business. It's applicable to really learning how to take care of our lives. So the email was titled, The World's Worst Boss. And the reason I'm reading this to you is because if you've been listening to this podcast for any length of time, you know that I'm uber passionate about teaching women how to be self-directed along their health journey. Because we know that self-directed people are able to make choices that are in line with who they are as people and what feels right for their life. And it's also a much more sustainable strategy than following someone else's roadmap. And I feel, of course, that the diet and fitness industry is largely about following someone else's roadmap. That's really what a lot of these cookie cutter programs are that women are buying into and ultimately failing. So I want to read this to you just as a little reminder for the power of learning how to be self-directed. So the world's worst boss, that would be you. Even if you're not self-employed, your boss is you. You manage your career, your day, your responses. You manage how to sell your services and your education and the way you talk to yourself. Odds are, you're doing it poorly. If you had a manager that talked to you the way that you talked to you, you'd quit. If you had a boss that wasted as much of your time as you do, they'd fire her. If an organization developed its employees as poorly as you're developing yourself, it would go under. I'm amazed at how often people choose to fail when they go out on their own or when they end up in one of those rare jobs that encourages one to set an agenda and manage themselves. Faced with the freedom to excel, They falter and hesitate and stall and ultimately punt. We're surprised when someone self-directed arrives on the scene. Someone who figures out a way to work from home and then turns that into a two-year journey, laptop in hand as they explore the world while doing their job. We're shocked that someone uses evenings and weekends to get a second education or start a useful new side business. And we're envious when we encounter someone who's managed to bootstrap themselves into happiness, as if that's rare or even uncalled for. There are a few good books on being a good manager, but fewer still on managing yourself. And it's hard to think of a more essential thing to learn. I love that. I think it's so good. I feel like he speaks so well to the power of being self-directed in that. And here are my thoughts. If you want to improve your health or any area of your life, not just for a few days or weeks, but for the long haul, 
You must learn how to manage yourself. And this is really the core message of Grace and Grit. Self-leadership is the basis of the work that I do. I teach my clients how to develop the skills that help them to improve their self-leadership abilities, specifically in the health arena, so they can end the madness of fad diets and exercise programs. If you missed out on last month's theme, which was self-leadership, It was episodes 159 through 163. I really encourage you to check it out. Of course, the title is Self-Leadership. It was all about self-leadership and learning how to be self-directed along your health journey. Something that I strongly feel the diet and fitness industry is not emphasizing enough. Self-direction is the magic sauce. Self-leadership is where the power is. Now, I'm going to move on to this month's theme, but I just came across that in my inbox the other day. Again, like I said, it's something I've had in there for a while, but I just was reminded of it and thought it was so relevant to the messages that we're talking about here on the podcast. So I hope that that you got something out of that. So the theme on the podcast this month is finding freedom through discipline. And over the course of the past two weeks, in episode 163, we talked about discipline not being a dirty word, because a lot of people have difficult associations with the word discipline. So in that episode, I really kind of gave some framework for reworking your definition of discipline. And in 164, episode 164, I talked about five ways to cultivate more self-discipline gracefully, (laughs) because you can do it gracefully. Now, if you're having a hard time keeping up on the podcast, right, that you kind of come in for one episode, but then you miss the next few, or you wish you had some reminders about the highlights of each episode, I've got really good news for you. We have created something really special for you. Because we run the podcast on monthly themes, we decided to create a free roadmap for each theme every month from now on. And essentially what the roadmap is, is it's it's a little PDF document that highlights the biggest key points of each episode. And it even has a spot for you to kind of take notes about your own takeaways. So if you want to access this month's roadmap, you simply need to head on over to graceandgrit.com forward slash discipline roadmap. Once again, it's graceandgrit.com forward slash discipline roadmap. Like I said, it's free. You do need to put in your email address so we know where to send it, but there's no other obligation beyond that. It's awesome. I think it's beautiful. I think it's a really cool thing to have on hand. So check it out. I'd love your feedback. If there's other things that you think we should be including on that, I'm all ears. You can always email me at Courtney at graceandgrit.com. Now this week, I want to talk about four skill sets that will skyrocket your success in really any arena. But of course, I love talking about the health arena. The first skill that will skyrocket your success. And I do put it first because I do believe it is the most important, is self-awareness. If you want to move your life to higher ground, it is absolutely imperative that you know your flaws and your faults. It is equally imperative that you know your strengths and your superpowers. I know. I know, the ego wants you to focus just on the latter. How fun would it be if we could just always focus on our strengths and superpowers, (laughs) right? It's not that I don't want you focusing on those things, or I don't think that you should be focusing on them. You should. It keeps you motivated. It helps you with confidence. However, if we're constantly ignoring our flaws and faults, We have gaps. And if those gaps aren't filled, we can't really live life at the elevation we want to live it at. 
So noticing your weak spots or areas that could use some improvement does not mean that you have to marinate in them. It does not mean that you have to beat yourself up about them. It most certainly doesn't mean that there is something wrong with you. Everything's right with you. You're a human. Flaws and faults come with the territory. (laughs) Acknowledging the areas where you lack some skill and proficiency is really how you get to know yourself. Self-awareness is the practice of acknowledging who you are and how you behave. And then you get the option of choosing what you can or even want to change. And you also get to choose what you want to accept. And I want to emphasize here that self-awareness is a practice. And the hustle of modern day life is making us more distracted than ever and more unaware than ever of the choices that we're making. Why is self-awareness so difficult? Well, it's difficult because many of us have programmed our mind for many years to practice certain behaviors that cause us to react without thinking. I mean, that's kind of what a habit is. It's a reaction that doesn't require much of a thought process. It's your brain's way of conserving energy. So we don't have to be self-aware to engage with behaviors. We can just react with behaviors that we've always been engaging with. But if those behaviors aren't serving our life, of course, that leads to problems. I think we also struggle with self-awareness because life is busy, And many women have crowded themselves right out of their own darn to-do list, right? Everyone else is on that list. Everything else is on that list, but they're nowhere on it. So we're busy to a fault. We're overscheduled, over-hustling, overworking to the point that we simply don't have time to be self-aware, And I will say, again, life is distracting, right? Especially in the age of computers and cell phones and so much opportunity, which is a beautiful thing. It's also a very dangerous thing. No one has time these days, it seems like, for self-awareness. We're too busy to be self-aware, which is largely why people don't change, So how can we develop self-awareness? Well, this will come as no surprise. I've talked a lot about self-awareness on this podcast, but I just want to kind of give you a few tools for today, places where you could maybe start building a practice of self-awareness. It doesn't have to be monumental. In fact, you know me. I encourage you to make it very small, make a commitment of starting to practice self-awareness on a small level. That might look like simply naming and noticing what you're feeling right now. Stop and ask yourself, what am I feeling? Right? What are you feeling emotionally? What are you feeling physically? Don't judge it. You don't need to judge it. You just need to name and notice it. Just notice. Naming and noticing is such a powerful practice. Easy to do and really easy not to do. But when you start becoming aware of how you are feeling emotionally and physically, you're able to make some, you're presented again with an opportunity to make some different choices about how you want to respond to that. Meditation, of course, incredibly powerful practice of self-awareness. Because in meditation, we are kind of forced to, to notice that monkey mind, those physical sensations, all the things that are happening within us, which is why a lot of people don't meditate. Because it's just, it would be, it's just easier to not have to focus on those things. And I always find it so interesting when people say, I can't meditate because I can't sit still or I just can't focus. But what I find so interesting is that the practice of meditation is about practicing 
the ability to refocus yourself. So when you sit down and you're not focused, that is the practice. The practice is recognizing that you're not focused and bringing your attention back to what you do want to focus on. And it's also noticing what's going on in your body without reacting to it. Journaling, I think, is an incredibly powerful self-awareness practice. I've done a lot of different renditions of journaling over my lifetime, but doing just a thought download every morning has been really instrumental in just seeing what is going on in my head. I can, t- I can take ownership of my thoughts when I actually see them on paper. I process differently on paper. So when I write down some of the things that are going on in my head, I'm usually much more descriptive and there's a lot more to it when I write it on page rather than just thinking it in my head. So journaling, I think, is incredibly powerful. And then, of course, another self-awareness practice that I think is immensely powerful is working with a coach, working with a counselor, working with a therapist, people to guide you into a space of more self-awareness. And why would we need somebody to help guide us into a space of self-awareness? Well, for one, a lot of us aren't very good at being accountable to ourselves to do it. But when we're actually, when we have an appointment with somebody to show up and do the practice when we show up, we're a lot more likely to do it. So there is an accountability level there, of course. But also, working with someone who can help guide you into more self-awareness is also very helpful because we get a lot of reminders about how essential it is to be kind to ourselves when we start looking at the parts of ourselves that we're not so proud of. Because for years, when I used to do that on my own, I would kind of marinate in all the things that were wrong with me. I would use it as an exercise in judgment and of kind of beating myself up for all the things that I lacked proficiency in. I used it as a reason to validate why I was broken. That is not helpful. That is not the point of self-awareness. Self-awareness is a practice of respect and love for yourself. I always use that analogy of the dirt under the rug. If you're not willing to look at the dirt under the rug, how are you ever going to clean it up? Looking at it doesn't mean that you have to suffer through it. It just means you need to acknowledge it, naming and noticing it. Not ignoring it, not distracting yourself from it, not making it define you, just noticing that it's there and making a choice about whether you want to accept it or you want to change it. The second skill set that will skyrocket your success is, of course, organization, which I have done many, many podcasts about also. You wouldn't try to save for retirement without some kind of plan, right? You wouldn't try to take a -a once-in-a-lifetime vacation without putting some forethought into where you want to go and how you're going to get there and what you're going to do when you get there. You probably wouldn't try to build your dream home without a well-thought-out plan of how you're going to do that. So why on God's green earth would you think that you can change your behavior in any area of your life without a plan? Why would you think that you can develop more self-discipline without a plan for doing that. This is where I see so many women swing from one end of the spectrum to the other. And what I mean by that is I see women that either don't make a plan for how they're going to do better, so everything is haphazard, or they buy into cookie cutter protocols that outline precisely every step they need to take to create a certain response. So not making a plan does not really work for change, right? Because if we don't have a plan in place, we're always just going to react in the way that we always have. And your reactions are what created your current results. So if you're not happy with those results, 
not having a plan is not going to work. But the problem with the other end of the spectrum, buying into cookie cutter programs, is that those programs do not take into consideration who you are as a person. They don't take into consideration your unique life challenges, your likes and dislikes. They basically completely dismiss your unique human beingness, which is why they aren't sustainable. They don't feel like they fit after a while. I don't think they ever feel like they fit, but we kind of force them on ourselves those first few weeks, and then we start straying from the plan because it's too extreme. It's not in line with who we are. It doesn't necessarily feel good. And so we end up stopping. So the fix here is to learn how to devise a daily plan, organizing yourself in a way that feels totally in line with who you are, where you are in your current stage of life, and what you feel will keep you in what I call the beautiful state of whelm. I've mentioned this before, but Susan David wrote a phenomenal book called Emotional Agility, and she talks about the state of whelm being the best place for us to actually create sustainable change. What does that mean? It means that you're not overwhelmed because when you're overwhelmed, when you commit too much too fast, the only thing you do is shut down because your brain perceives that as a threatening thing. So we don't want to be overwhelmed. And we don't want to be underwhelmed. Underwhelmed is where we're bored. It's where we just feel unenthusiastic because we don't feel challenged. We want a little bit of challenge. We just don't want too much challenge. So we have to find that beautiful state of whelm for ourselves. So building the skill of organizing yourself is such a powerful practice. Consider planning your day, your day of activities. Better yet, consider planning your day of activities in a way that is completely in line with the values at this age and stage of life. Because a lot of people are good at scheduling their days. But when you look at their calendars and you ask them their values, there's a complete misalignment there because the things they say they value are showing up nowhere on their calendar. Organizing your food for the day, this of course is a lot of work that I do with my clients who are trying to improve their health. We are so reactive around food. We've been eating our entire life, multiple meals a day. And if we want to improve our relationship with food, we need a plan on how we're going to do that. Otherwise, we're going to keep reacting in the way we always have. And nobody comes to me to work with me because they have an awesome relationship with food or they feel like they're, you know, eating a really nutrient-dense diet most days of the week. (laughs) That is not why people hire me. So if we want to change, we want to improve, we've got to have a plan for how we're going to do that. So planning your food a day ahead So planning today what you're going to eat tomorrow is an incredibly powerful practice. And of course, the trick with that is now following through with the plan that you've created for yourself, which I'm going to talk about here in just a second. But the other thing I want to emphasize here is planning your workouts. I am the type of person, if I go into the gym or I create time in my day to just move my body, but I don't really have a plan for how I'm going to do that, holy cow, can I waste a lot of time. I kind of meander. I kind of go from one thing to the next. I'm not really doing anything full out. I talk to a lot of people. It's just very muddled. But when I go into the gym with a plan for what I am going to accomplish in my time there, it's awesome. I feel like I really get the most out of my time. So organization and planning takes time, which is, again, is why most people don't do it. They rationalize with themselves, I'm too busy. I don't have time to make a plan. Okay, do you have time to feel like hell? Do you have time to be sick? Do you have time to feel always exhausted? Do you have time to stay in a space of self-loathing? Of course you don't. But that's really what you're doing by not making time to plan and organize yourself. So I want you just to remember that planning and organizing absolutely takes time, but it saves you time and it saves you energy 
And above all else, it saves you regret of not living your life the way you really want to be living it. So learning how to organize and learning how to plan is a skill set that I strongly encourage all of my clients to be very self-disciplined about. So now let's talk about follow through because you can have great self-awareness. You can create an awesome plan for how you're going to do better. And then you know what happens when you create those things. You have self-awareness, you create the plan. A lot of people don't show up to do the work. Follow through is 100% mindset work. Showing up to do the work you committed to or not showing up to the work that you committed to doing has everything to do with how you're thinking. You may have lost track of the reasons why you wanted to change in the first place. I call those compelling reasons. If you've lost track of your compelling reasons and you're not visiting them on a very regular basis to remind yourself why you're doing the work, you won't do the work. You won't show up to do the work. It'll fade. Your excitement about doing the work will fade. So I've done, again, I've done a podcast on cultivating motivation, on morning routines, lots of podcasts about how to uh, generate motivation every day because motivation is not going to find you. If it does, it's like a blue moon. It happens once in a great while. We've got to find it every day. And that's our work. You also may struggle with follow through because you aren't really intent on finding solutions. You just want to marinate in the idea that you're broken or that something's wrong with you or that you don't have time or that you're confused or that you're overwhelmed. You're just indulging in very unhelpful emotions. And in my opinion, if you aren't intent on finding solutions to your problems for the reasons why you're rationalizing you can't show up to do the work, you're not really intent on succeeding. Because anytime you commit to up-leveling your life, there are going to be a lot of obstacles and a lot of challenges that need a lot of solutions. But if you're not willing to rumble, which is always how I like to phrase it, right? Brene Brown talks a lot about rumbling. If you're not willing to rumble with obstacles and experiment with some possible solutions, you're probably never going to succeed. Follow through, I also believe, is very difficult for people because they're not willing to manage negative emotions. So I feel tired. I just feel unexcited. I feel unmotivated. I have too much to do. I'm stressed out. I'm overwhelmed, right? All those thoughts, if they're not useful to you, and the only way they're useful to you is if they're actually helping you to produce a result that you want. So if those thoughts are not useful, you need to manage your thoughts. You need to choose better thoughts, which is an option. I think with follow through, Often we need accountability initially because being accountable to ourselves alone, it's really easy to hide behind that. So if you don't show up for yourself and you haven't told anybody that you committed to showing up for yourself, it's really easy to just not show up for yourself. But when you tell somebody or lots of somebodies that you're making this change in your life and that you're, you're not shameful of it, you're actually asking for support, that empowers you to follow through. I also think women struggle to follow through because they aren't taking notice of everything that is going right. So even though self-awareness, like I said at the beginning, is about noticing our flaws and our challenges, the behaviors that we want to change, it is equally about taking notice of all that is right about us. And if you are hell-bent along your journey to change on just focusing on the hardships and the things that need improving, you will get deflated very fast. And I will be very shocked if you're able to sustain any change that you make. You might also not be following through because you're addicted to taking passive action. What does that mean? It means that you read the books, you listen to the podcasts, you sign up for the gym membership, You buy the new workout outfit, you buy into the new diet plan, 
but you don't do the work. We can get stuck in that cycle for a really long time. I've been there, bought into lots of programs, you know, because I was so hell-bent on changing, but then I never did anything. So I would ask yourself today, when it comes to my health, am I taking passive action? Am I convincing myself that I need to read another book? that I need to find another teacher, that I need to have a better workout program in order to start moving forward. If you're telling yourself that, you're lying to yourself. You're just using it as rationale for not doing the work. What are you going to do today that actually moves you in the direction of progress? Reading the book does not move you in the direction of progress. Buying the outfit does not move you in the direction of progress. Researching the latest fad diet online does not move you in the direction of progress. But going for a walk today, eating some extra vegetables, drinking a little bit more water, taking out five minutes of your day to do a little meditation, that will move you in the direction of progress. I've talked about these things before, but I also think that people struggle with follow through because the circles of expectation are way too big. We talked about that last week. They aren't managing their energy well. So they're going to bed really late at night. They're getting up super early in the morning. They're wondering why they don't have the energy to show up for themselves. It's no mystery. You're not setting boundaries and parameters around things that will enable you to show up fully for yourself. We also struggle to follow through because we're not willing to set boundaries with other people because we don't want to make them uncomfortable. So we sacrifice our own comfort and what we ultimately want for our own life to make other people happy. Again, that's a mindset issue. I also, and this is so important that I mention this, I think one of the big reasons that a lot of women struggle to continuously follow through with the things they want to be doing for themselves is because the way they are measuring progress is misaligned with their values. So they say they want to improve their health because they want to be able to have more confidence and show up for their life more fully and feel happier in their relationships, to feel like they're not hiding anymore. And how do they measure progress? They get on the damn scale. If that's your definition of health, all those other things, why would you use getting on the scale to measure that progress. Now, please don't hear me saying I don't think the scale ever has a time and place. I do. But I think a lot of women get so hyper-focused on the scale, they fail to measure progress in so many other ways that are in line with what they really want. So let's talk about the fourth skill set that I think is absolutely invaluable for creating progress in your life. And that is realigning yourself. I'm going to talk about this all next week on the podcast, but I just want to kind of give you a little intro to this concept right now. Life is going to throw you a lot of curveballs. What do I mean by a curveball? Well, anything that throws you out of alignment. And in my opinion, there's a few different kinds of curveballs. There is the unforeseen, the foreseen, and self-induced. So unforeseen curveballs are challenges that you could never see coming and therefore you are never prepared for. The illness, the injury, the death in the family, the crisis. You can't see those things coming. But when they come, holy cow, do they throw you off your game and you get very misaligned. Foreseen challenges, foreseen curveballs are things that you can kind of predict are coming, but they sometimes pose a bigger challenge than you expected, like travel, like having to have a surgery, a big life transition, like a marriage, a move, a new job, any kind of new relationship. That can def- definitely misalign us. And what do I mean by misalignment? I mean, we, st- we stop doing things that are in line with what we truly want for ourselves. And I'm specifically, of course, speaking to health. So we move across country and we stop eating healthy for, you know, for the next couple of months because we're too overwhelmed. Again, the story we're telling ourselves in our head. We have the surgery so we can't exercise regularly And so we convince ourselves there's nothing we can do to take care of ourselves. 
Those are just ways we misalign ourselves. And finally, I want to talk about the self-induced curveball. <laughs> this is my favorite because I find a lot of women get very caught up in this. The self-induced curveball is working really hard to create progress with your health and then starting to test the waters to the point that you start heading down a slippery slope of lots of compromising and negotiating. And this sounds like a terrible way to say it, but I often say that this is where people get a little bit cocky. They create some progress in their life. Let's just say they have a weight loss goal. So they lose like 15 to 20 pounds and they're feeling really good and they're noticing all the benefits. And that is where we start getting a little bit cocky and we start testing the waters with what we can get away with. And we test the waters to the point of regaining 5, 10, 15 pounds And then sort of tell ourselves, I have no idea what happened. Well, sure you do. You just don't necessarily want to take responsibility for it. So that's definitely misalignment, right? Resistance is self-induced misalignment. When we kind of give over to resistance all the time to the point that we're no longer showing up to do the work. So like I said, I'm going to talk all next week about the concept of misalignment and how we can start identifying ways that we are misaligned and how we can quickly bring ourselves back into alignment. Because if you could learn that skill, you would never again have to reach for a diet or, you know, anything extreme in your wellness journey because you recognize when you're misaligned and you have a strategy for how to bring yourself back into alignment very quickly. That's what self-leadership is. So I hope you'll come back next week. I'm excited for that podcast. I just want to mention one more time that for those of you who might have come in late or you are just kind of listening to the tail end of the show or you kind of forgot about this already, we've created a free roadmap for the theme, Finding Freedom Through Discipline. So if you've been enjoying the podcast this month, I strongly encourage you to head on over to graceandgrit.com forward slash discipline roadmap graceandgrit.com forward slash discipline roadmap. And you'll get an outline of everything that we have talked about to date. You'll even get kind of a little bit of a peek into next week. And you'll be able to take some notes on your greatest takeaways. But it's a really cool thing. I hope this is helpful. This is why I created this document. There's Again, it's free. There's nothing we expect from you. We do need an email address so we can get it to you. Um, But I would love your feedback, truly. I would love your feedback because, again, I create these things to help you. If it's not helpful, I want to know so I can make it better. Just like the reviews on the podcast, if you're going to leave a review, first of all, thank you. But if you're not going to leave a five-star review, fine, cool. But please give me feedback on why. Because I find people who leave anything less than five stars generally do not tell me what I can do to get to five stars. And this is, you know, this is just accepting honest feedback. I don't hold that information back from my clients. They hire me to be very honest with them about what needs to change to make progress. I want to know that from you too. So if there's anything that you've been nervous to tell me or (laughs) you, you just would like me to know that would be helpful Obviously, there's a graceful way to deliver constructive criticism, but I, I'm all ears about this document that we're creating for you, about the podcast in general. Let me know. I hope this was helpful. I hope you have a fabulous day. I really hope you'll join me next week so we can talk about the power of realigning yourself. That's it, my friends. Have a wonderful day. I'll see you soon. Thank you for listening to the Grace and Grit podcast. It is time to mend the fabric of the female health story. And it starts with you taking radical responsibility for your own self-care. You are worth the effort. And with a little grace and grit, anything is possible.